One of the good things to come out of the COVID pandemic was it accelerated research on a lot of fronts, including vaccines and deeper knowledge about the immune system. Internationally there were some spectacular treatment trials, like the enormous recovery trial in the UK, which used electronic records in the National Health Service to recruit massive numbers of people with COVID and discovered early on that hydroxychloroquine didn't work, and that a $6 a day steroid, dexamethasone, reduced death rates by 20%. In Australia too there was a substantial flurry of clinical trials, but an analysis out today in the Medical Journal of Australia has shown a disturbing degree of poor science, waste, and what could only be described as selfish behaviour on the part of researchers. Professor Angela Webster is a clinical epidemiologist at the University of Sydney's National Health and Medical Research Council's Clinical Trials Centre, which did the study. Welcome. Thanks for having me. What did you do in this study? Well, we wanted to have a look at the kind of activity and research that was going on focused on COVID in Australia, and so we looked at the Australia and New Zealand Clinical Trials Registry and also chemicaltrials.gov, which are registries which capture clinical trial activity. Over 95% of the trials that happen in Australia are registered on one of these. And we looked for the evidence of COVID trials that were recruiting patients in Australia and decided to examine things about those trials, the way that they were focused, what they were going to do about data sharing, what they were actually delivering. And what did you find? Between January and November last year, we found there was 1,600 trials, and of which 1,100 were recruiting in Australia, and of those about 68 were trials on COVID. 56 of those were targeting COVID directly, and another 12 were looking at other effects of the pandemic such as impacts on mental health. And of those we found that most of those, only 4 were finished of those trials, the others were either recruiting at the time, or planning to recruit patients. And when you looked at the design, the design was wanting. To a certain extent, yes. We know that there are certain innovations that can be used to deliver research quickly, and there were some innovations that trialists had used. They'd used innovative ways of recruiting patients, digital ways, they had used telephone and video calls where normally they would do things face to face. And there were some other innovations in the way that the things they were testing, like nanoparticles for deliverhood vaccine, that's very cutting edge, and some other innovative innovations, but innovations in the fundamental design of the trial were lacking. We know that we can use some statistical techniques called adaptive design trials, which allow you to change up the intervention you're delivering, the drug you are delivering, and adapt to evidence that shows maybe some things are more promising than others. Which is what the British did in the recovery trial. Exactly. We found only two of the trials in Australia were using adaptive design. So the innovation in the way the trials were carried out and fundamentally designed was really disappointing. And they were too small often to actually find the answer that they were looking for. Exactly. The average sample size in these trials was 150 patients that the trials were aiming to recruit, whereas we know, for instance, the trial you mentioned in the UK looking at steroids for COVID pneumonia needed over 4,000 people to show a difference in mortality. The trials that were happening in Australia were really small, and they also often weren't measuring the things that really matter, what we call the core outcomes. Only half of those trials measured mortality. And gobsmackingly last year I still found people doing trials into hydroxychloroquine when we knew it was useless drug. We found over six of those, yes, although I have had a quick look in the registry since. We finished this research at Christmas time. It has only just been published now, so some delay there, and I had a look at the update and many of the hydroxychloroquine trials that were being undertaken in Australia have now been abandoned, but that represents some waste in the effort of course. Talking of waste, have you got any sense of the funding? About 70% of the trials we looked at had no form of commercial funding at all, which suggests that they are either from philanthropic or government sources, we couldn't analyze further than that. But we did find a rather disappointing commitment to sharing data beyond the end of the trial. By sharing data onwards, 
The International Committee of Medical Journal Editors says that sharing data is an ethical obligation because it allows you to maximize the value of the research you've undertaken by on sharing the data so it can be reanalyzed and get some really granular findings of who might benefit or be harmed from certain interventions or approaches. And we found that over 80% of the trials had not declared a commitment to share their data, and about 70% actively said they weren't going to share their data. And that's really disappointing. What is going on there? The way they bang on. The National Health Medical Research Council has been banging on for years about what a wonderful collaborative research community we've got. It's not true. You're right. We had a look at some of the reasons, and there is some confusion. About half of the trials gave no reason at all for why they wouldn't share their data. About another 20% had a mixture of reasons such as worrying that they could do this whilst protecting the participant privacy, so worries about protecting the privacy of the participants in their trials. Some stated that they lacked ethical approval to unshare their data. So those are pathetic reasons, there are de-identified data and you've just got to submit to the ethics committee. I mean, really. Well, you'd think that it could be built into the trial. I think in some of the speed of trying to get trials going, people were forgetting that they had a commitment and a duty to maximize the public investment in their research. On sharing data is an incredibly important part of that, but often an afterthought by many trialists, sadly. So presumably with so few trials completed and many still recruiting, and there's already a high failure rate in clinical trials in Australia in terms of getting them off the ground, not a good sign. Was there a gap in what they were studying? In other words, were they missing research? That's a very good point. We found that most trials focused on drug interventions and pharmaceuticals with a limited amount on other supportive strategies. But what we really found the gap for was no trials of public health messaging or health service delivery, and the number that were targeted were particularly vulnerable populations, so those at high risk of bad outcomes of COVID, that was only in 10% of the trials. The public health messaging was entirely absent. And given the way that the pandemic has played out in Australia, generating evidence quickly for public health messaging and targeting those most vulnerable would have been the most valuable to Australia. Some lessons learnt. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me.